Alrighty, so all we're going to do is just kind of go through the basic content that we find in Unit 2. So Unit 1 was all about the atom, and Unit 2 then gets into the molecules. So what kind of bonds and those kinds of things. So let's just jump right in. We can describe bonds as an attractive force that hold things together. When you form bonds, it releases energy, and when you break bonds, it takes energy. We settle these types of bonds into three basic types. You've got ionic where electrons are shared, where one thing takes electrons and the other thing gives electrons away, creating ions that attract each other. You've got the covalent bond where things are sharing electrons and they can be both polar covalent or non-polar covalent. And then you've got the metallic bonds, metals all stuck together and kind of that sea of electrons floating around. So a chemical bond is just the balance of attractive and repulsive forces. When two atoms are attracted to each other, the protons on one are being attracted to the electrons on the other. But if you get too close, then the protons of one start to push against the protons of the other. And the electrons of one start to push against the electrons of the other. So it's really a balanced force. Where do the forces of attraction balance out with the forces of repulsion? An ionic compound is made up of a lattice of ions. So you've got positive and negative ions. They will take on a structure where the positive ions can be attracted to the negative ions and vice versa, arranging themselves into a nice regular repeating structure we call a crystal lattice. The lattice energy is similar to a bond energy. So bond energy is all types of things have bond energy. Lattice energy is a specific type of that. Lattice energy is very much tied to the idea of Coulomb's law, the idea that the positive ion is attracted to the negative ion. When those two ions are attracted to each other and form a solid from gaseous molecules, how much energy is released? Part of this unit is the idea of Lewis structures, and we oftentimes don't write Lewis structures for ionic compounds. But basically, everyone's trying to look like a noble gas. So metals will tend to lose electrons, and they will look like their closest noble gas. Non-metals will gain them, and in doing so, they become ions. Metallic bonds are oftentimes simplified. They say that there's positive metals and electrons nobody wants. Well, there actually is a sea of electrons and they're not held that tightly, but it's not like that sea of electrons has absolutely no attraction to the nuclei. There is a force of attraction. A metal is quite strong because of those attractions between electrons and protons in the nucleus. It just has a different characteristic as a substance because those electrons are loosely held and they can flow around. We don't see that in covalent and we don't see that in ionic. In order to be successful in this unit, students just need to understand what are the hallmarks of an ionic compound versus a metallic compound versus a covalent compound. So they should know this basic vocabulary. We also get into alloys in AP chemistry. Now you can go digging through alloy structures in your book and you will find that there is a whole lot more to this. But a good source for knowledge here is the Pogel that's all about alloys. Basically, when you mix metals together, you can come up with two basic types. You can come up with a substitutional alloy where one metal atom is taken out and replaced with another one versus the interstitial where there's some spaces in between and you can actually drop smaller atoms in those spaces. You could see on the left a substitutional and an interstitial on the right. These types of questions are often seen on the AP exam, so don't forget to run over to the released multiple choice and take a look so that you can get an idea of what types of questions are being asked. Another picture of alloys, just driving home that basic knowledge about what is a pure metal versus an alloy and the idea of substitutional and interstitial. And you can actually combine those two if you really wanted to be fancy about it. So covalent compounds is then what we spend an awful lot of time on. We're going to draw Lewis structures. We're going to do formal charge. And so covalent compounds are where electrons are being shared. And again, they're doing this to achieve that noble gas configuration. We can describe a lot of things about a covalent compound. We can talk about what is that distance between nuclei when the forces of repulsion are balanced by the forces of attraction. And we would call that distance the bond length. We can also talk about the bond energy, right? Just like lattice energy and ionic compounds, 
you can talk about the bond energy of a covalent compound. Covalent compounds also are different because they introduce the idea of a single bond, a double bond, and a triple bond. There's a good chance you'll see this graph on the AP exam, and students are asked to interpret this graph for what it means. So this point down here, the lowest point on the graph, this is the point of lowest potential energy. So this is the point where forces of repulsion are balanced by the forces of attraction. Up here, those two are too close together and there's actually a force of repulsion. And over here, they're too far apart. And so you wanna end up somewhere down here at the very, very bottom of the curve where the lowest potential energy and that drop of potential energy is the amount of energy released as bonds are being formed. So when two elements share electrons, we call that a covalent bond. And then we can talk about, okay, where are the lone pairs? How many lone pairs? Where are those lone pairs? What type of hybridization and things like that? So we can see in the slide that there's a single bond when hydrogen bonds to oxygen to make water. That's one pair of electrons being shared. Or you can have a double bond or a triple bond. And we differentiate between how many pairs of electrons are involved in bonding and how many pairs of electrons are involved in lone pairs or non-bonding pairs. So just like in unit one, where atomic structure is involved, the length of covalent bond has everything to do with those periodic trends. So hydrogen is gonna have a much smaller covalent bond just because the atoms themselves are smaller. HI is considerably bigger, largely because iodine in and of itself is a huge atom compared to hydrogen. So we make the general note, and this is only a general note because there are a few exceptions along the way, that a triple bond is shorter than a double bond is shorter than a single bond. If you'd like to demonstrate this for your students, take a heavy weight that has a hook on top. Usually your physics teacher will have one. Put a rubber band around a pencil or a pen or a rod and hang that weight by one rubber band. Measure that distance. Then use two rubber bands and then three. And what you'll see is that three rubber bands makes that distance between the stick or the pencil and the weight shorter than just the single rubber band. Once we've established what kind of bond there is, we can look and say, is that a polar bond or a non-polar bond? And this all goes back to unit one where you're talking about atomic structure and what's the electronegativity. What is the pull on the electrons by that nucleus? In this particular case, hydrogen fluoride the fluorine is much more electronegative than the hydrogen, so the electrons end up much more around the fluorine than the hydrogen, creating a polar bond and a polar molecule. Electronegativity values are not given on the AP exam. So the kids really need to know that any two dissimilar things, so carbon and carbon, definitely nonpolar. Carbon and hydrogen, anything that's different is going to be ever so slightly polar. But at some point we have to say, well, what's the difference between ever so slightly polar and polar? And in general, because we don't have numbers to worry about, we say that anything that's just a hydrocarbon, so carbons and hydrogens, that is going to be nonpolar. Past that, they'll have to make decisions about which one is a more polar bond. And the difference in more polar bond they ought to be able to do because they know the trends of electronegativity on the periodic table. So this is an example you can do with your kids. Given the electronegativity values, they ought to be able to do the math and decide, is it ionic, polar covalent, or nonpolar covalent? There is no one way to write Lewis structures. However, you need to find the way it works for you. This is an example of one. And you gotta make sure that you don't mix together methods of writing Lewis structures. So don't take the one from the book and the one from here and mix them together because that's just gonna confuse you and your students. What you wanna get away from is having the students draw dots around the element and then circling the dots that are being shared. This is not biology. We need to think about that all the electrons belong to all the atoms. So carbon doesn't have four valence electrons, and those are the only ones it can use to make a bond. The molecule CO2 has a, actually has 16 electrons total that you can put wherever you want to to satisfy the octet of each atom. 
So this is an example that you can do step by step with your students. Basically, the idea is the least electronegative nitrogen in this case goes in the middle. You count up how many total valence electrons you have. Everybody gets hooked together with a single bond. You then throw extra electrons on everything on the exterior, all the fluorines in this case, and then anything extra goes on that central atom. So you create this structure. Now it is worth it to say that some elements can actually have more than eight. So as we expand the octet, it's important to realize and teach your students that only elements in the third row of the periodic table and below can actually exceed the octet. So fluorine is in the second row of the periodic table, as is nitrogen. It could never have any more than eight. The reason for that is that in the third row, there's a D sublevel. So normally we say, well, there's the 3s and the 3p, and that's a total of eight electrons. But there's also a 3d sublevel, and that gives you a place where you can put other electrons to exceed that octet. So fluorine can never have 12, it has to stop at eight. Formal charge will most likely be a new idea for you and your students. So the idea here is, how do you decide which Lewis structure is better? So you draw out a Lewis structure, and oftentimes when you do one for say SO4 or SO3 or something like that, students in your room will create two or three different Lewis structures that all seem to follow the rules. And then you have to decide which one is the best. We use formal charge for that. So the basic idea is how many valence electrons does something have? So in this case, the carbon in the middle has four minus the total number of non-bonding electrons. So carbon has no non-bonding electrons minus one half the total number of bonding electrons. So you would add up each bond, one, two, three, four. So four bonds is a total of eight electrons. So the math ends up being four, number of valence electrons, minus zero, minus four equals zero. So the formal charge on the carbon would be zero. And there's some practice questions as you go through there. So your kids can work on assigning formal charge and then figuring out which one is the best Lewis structure. In order for the formal charge thing to work, all the formal charges have to add up to zero or the formal charges have to equal the charge of the polyatomic ion. So we've got eight COH in this very weird molecule that we've probably never seen before. We do the math just like we did before, and we end up with a formal charge of negative one for carbon and positive one for oxygen. So then the students have to use this data. Is this a valid Lewis diagram? And they would go, oh, well, plus one and minus one, they do add up to zero, so that's good. But they then have to look and say, okay, for a formal charge though, who should get to be negative and who should get to be positive? So the general rule is whoever the most electronegative element in that compound, if anybody gets to be negative, it is that element. So in this case, carbon here is a minus one and oxygen is a positive one. This is the very same structure that we saw previously. The only difference here is instead of two hydrogens on the left and one oxygen on the right with a double bond is we took one of the hydrogens from the left and moved it over to the right. So this is not a good Lewis structure because it doesn't have everybody trying to be zero, which is the best thing you can hope for in formal charge. Instead, the oxygen's a positive one and the carbon's a negative one. So that would be the data that you could use to argue that this is not the best Lewis structure. In summary, these are the rules for how to use formal charge in deciding which Lewis structure is the best. So between these two examples that we just looked at, obviously the one on the right is the better one. Resonance just means that the double bond in a molecule doesn't actually live there. We know that electrons are constantly moving. Unfortunately, when you draw a Lewis structure, you can't really draw the electrons jumping from one side to the other side. So when we draw a resonance structure, basically we're saying the double bond could live on the left or it could live on the right. 
And for carbonate down at the bottom, again, we have that double bond at the bottom or the left or the right. All three would be valid resonance structures. There are a couple molecules that are exceptions to the octet rule. For example, hydrogen is good with two electrons. It doesn't need eight. Beryllium is good with four and boron's good with six. It's not to say that boron can't have eight. Of course it can, but boron is happy with six and will form a stable molecule. Beryllium is happy with four and hydrogen is good with two. Just like we talked about bond lengths, we can also talk about bond energy. This is the energy that it takes to break a bond or the energy that's released as a bond is formed. This will become very important when we get to thermochemistry and the idea of changes in enthalpy. What the take home message in this unit is, is they ought to be able to gauge which one has a higher bond energy and why. And just like single bonds were the longest bond and triple bonds were the shortest bond, triple bonds tend to have a greater bond energy and single bonds tend to have the lowest bond energy. And you can see here in this data that the triple bond has a much higher bond energy than the double bond of oxygen. So we have a Lewis structure for a covalent compound. We've done the formal charge and decided if we have more than one, which one is the best. So finally, what is its shape going to be? What is the geometry, the molecular geometry of something? To do that, we have to look at all the regions of electrons around that central atom. In general, AB2, how many things are stuck to the atom versus how many lone pairs are on the central atom? Well, there's one area of electrons on the left, one area on the right. So that's gonna create a 180 degree bond angle and that molecule will be linear. For example, beryllium chloride has, again, four electrons that it has around it, but one area of electrons on the left, one area on the right, because electrons repel each other. This keeps going for a number of examples. What if you do something that has three areas of electrons? Well, that three areas of electrons means the bond angle will no longer be 180, it has to be 120. What is a circle, 360 degrees, split into three even wedges, 120 degrees piece? We call that trigonal or trigonal planar. For something with four things attached, carbon tetrachloride is a good example, we say that shape is tetrahedral. Now notice, even though there are lone pairs on the atoms on the very outside, we don't care about those. We only care about how many unbonded pairs or how many lone pairs are there on the central atom. So in the student notes, there's a table that has bond angles and shapes. And this is one of the things that students need to commit to memory and also use the FET molecule shapes tool to kind of build molecules and get an idea of what they look like in their mind. They need to be able to picture the molecules and then take a guess as to what the bond angle is. So this is a table of many of the shapes and the bond angle when we're just thinking about in general. The bond angle can actually change here based on what are the elements that are involved in the bond. Because sometimes you can have a greater repulsive force simply because you have a bigger cloud of electrons. Now notice in the tetrahedral, we think the bond angle is gonna be 109. In a trigonal pyramidal where we have one lone pair, we think it's gonna be 109, but it's actually less. And when it's bent or angular with two lone pairs, it's even less. So let's get into that a little bit more. Every time you have a lone pair, that lone pair has a greater repulsive force. While students will memorize the 109.5, just understand that if you have lone pairs of electrons in there, it's gonna push it to be less than 109.5. So we have the geometries, we have the Lewis structures, which tells us where the electrons are. Then we can look at deciding, is it a polar molecule? How much of a dipole moment is there? Later on in intermolecular forces, we will use this information to decide some things about the molecules. But for right now, we're only concerned with, is this a polar molecule or not? Does it have a dipole moment or not? In the molecule NH3 on the left, all the electrons are being drawn towards nitrogen because again, that's more electronegative. Since the electrons are being pulled towards the nitrogen and it is a trigonal pyramidal molecule, that creates a negative end of the molecule up by the nitrogen and a positive end of the molecule 
down in, by the hydrogens. We say that this has a dipole moment. The one on the right, NF3, has a different dipole moment, but it's fluorine pulling on the electrons harder this time. So even though there's a lone pair of electrons up here by the nitrogen, the fact that fluorine is more electronegative means the electrons are being drawn largely down towards the bottom of the molecule, creating a little bit of a negative charge down below and a positive charge up at the top of the nitrogen. The dipole moment is less because nitrogen and fluorine have more similar electronegativity values. So when you're deciding on dipole moments, you really have to look at is the pull on the electrons and the red arrows show which way the electrons being pulled. Does the pull on the electrons cancel each other out or are the electrons being gathered to one end of the molecule, creating a negative end and being left out of one end of the molecule creating a positive end. If you've decided on the Lewis structure, you've picked the best Lewis structure with formal charge, you've decided on the geometry and whether or not it's polar, we can also talk about hybridization. Hybridization is nothing more than how do you make a place for those electrons to go? If you have a tetrahedral molecule, you have one atom in the center connected to four other things. We know from experimentation and analysis that all four of those bonds have the same energy and are the same length. So it's not that you're using an S orbital to make one bond and a P orbital to make a different bond. You're mixing together the S and the P orbitals in order to create areas that all have the same amount of energy and all have the same length. For beryllium chloride, here's what I tell my students. Ask yourself the question, how many things is beryllium stuck to? Two. How many lone pairs are there around that? None. Add those two numbers together. Two plus zero is two. That means we need two regions of electron density. One to bond with the chlorine on the left, one to bond with the chlorine on the right. So in order to do that, we have to mix together an S orbital and a p orbital, and we create two sp hybridized orbitals. We'll use one of those orbitals for the left, one orbital for the right. You can also have three regions of electron density. So down here at the bottom, again, same trick. Boron is tied to fluorine, but there are no lone pairs around it. So boron is connected to three things, and again, connected to, not how many bonds, because it could be a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond, doesn't matter. How many things is it connected to plus the number of lone pairs? So I create three regions of electrons, three bonds, three regions of electrons. You always use the S. So you're gonna use an S in two of the P orbitals, and you're gonna create three sp2 hybridized orbitals, places to put those electrons. If you need four regions of electrons, and this is honestly where it stops, how many things is the nitrogen connected to? Three. How many lone pairs are around the nitrogen? One. Three plus one is four. That means you need to use the S, so take away the S, and you need to use all three Ps. So you will create four sp3 hybridized orbitals, and that's what you're seeing here in blue. Each one of those is a sp3 hybridized orbital. So you mix together the S orbital, the three P orbitals, you mush them all together and create four equal energy, equal length orbitals that tie the hydrogens to the nitrogen and allow for the lone pair to live. So what happens if you don't use all your P orbitals in a molecule? Oftentimes the unused P orbitals will be used to create a pi bond. It's a place for other electrons to live. A sigma bond is where one orbital, oftentimes a hybridized orbital, overlaps with the orbital from another atom. So we call that an internuclear bond because it's right down the middle between the two atoms. If you have leftover p orbitals, you can create these pi bonds. It's a place for the electrons to be above and below that initial single bond. So here's a single bond between the two carbons. We call that a sigma bond. 
The bond between carbon and hydrogen is also a sigma bond. Here's ethene. Ethene, the two carbons are linked to each other with a double bond. The first bond that forms by the overlap of orbitals, we would call a sigma bond, and the second bond would be a pi bond. So over on the right-hand side, those two things that look like hot dogs, that's a region of space represented by those two hot dogs that says this is one pi bond. And to make those areas to put electrons, we use those leftover p orbitals. For a triple bond, like in ethyne here, you would have that internuclear overlap, the sigma bond between the two carbons. You'd have two gray hot dogs, one top and one bottom, that's one pi bond. And then you'd have two gray hot dogs, one coming out towards you and one on the back that represents the second pi bond. If you remember when I was talking about Lewis structures, I said not all the electrons belong to a given atom. You are free to put those electrons wherever you want to to draw your Lewis structures. The delocalized electron model is exactly this, that when you have the electrons, they don't stay put. They're constantly moving around. And since they're constantly moving around, then we say that that double bond doesn't just live in one place. It can actually be in another place. So we can also create something here called bond order. And really quickly, the bond order is just basically like an average of how many bonds it has. So that carbon-carbon bond in benzene here, it's not that one's a single and one's a double, it's really that each one is more like a bond and a half. So the bond length for these bonds would not be a long one and then a short one corresponding to a single bond and a double bond, they'd all be somewhere in between.